Hello, and welcome to the Mr. 50mm YouTube channel. I'm Mr. 50mm. Today, you can call me Mr. Fixit. Today, I'm going, to, I'm going to share with you a tip for how I get cameras on the cheap. Okay, this is, I admit, a clickbait title. The uh, trick isn't really a trick. Uh, it's more of a skill. Are you ready for the info about how, in this case, I got an Olympus E1? for way less than the current going right rate, the trick is easy. I simply repaired an Olympus E1. I ended up buying this E1 and this less than functioning E1. They're both less functioning at the time. This one's now functioning. But I ended up buying two E1s for a fraction of the price of what it's worth to get a uh, single working E1, and I assembled both of them into a functioning DSLR. And, uh, you know, I figured I might as well make a video, another video, talking about the repair. But this time I'm going to go into a bit more depth as to, like, a little more general tippages. Plus, it's just kind of nice to fix a camera or fix something and prevent it from going into the landfill. Uh, so, yeah, just before we get started or talk about other things, I wanted, I wanted to show you this E1. It is quite banged up. At this point, most of the things aren't really screwed together. Yeah, your top plate just comes out. And, you know, it's basically a little husk at this point. But, do you know what's really neat? After I took all the parts I needed to make my working E1, uh, you get to disassemble a little more than, you know, what I might have normally done. And I got to yank out this thing. Let's see if it'll focus. Oh, come on, there we go. All right, so that is the four thirds sensor, the Kodak sensor that is in here. It's the, uh, yeah, it's the famous Kodak five megapixel unit powering the inside of this camera. All right, now, Here's the thing that I've learned about doing repairs across many different things, from random widgets to iPads to cameras. In terms of electronics, older DSLRs and generally cameras, they're a cut above when it comes to repairability. Just on the scale of, you know, iPhones to like cameras, iPhones are way somewhere down, down there. And the Older DSLR cameras, they're, they're quite high in repairability. Admitted, admittedly, they look daunting at first. You know, you got this weird shape, a lot of electronics kind of going everywhere, and it looks like it'd be a real pain in the butt. You know, there's a lot of layered circuit boards, a million tiny screws, but really, with a little bit of organizational skill, a steady hand, I'm pretty sure anyone can repair a DSLR. Compared to trying to repair modern phones or tablets, this is kind of like just fancy Legos. Many cameras that I've opened up tend to have like really like well thought out, well laid out, uh, you know, connections and things are just flat flex connectors, a lot of screws and circuit boards. But the thing is, a lot of times the circuit boards are broken out into their actual individual function so that if something breaks along the line, you can take the bad part out and then put in a new one. And something that's kind of nice with the cameras is that, you know, you shouldn't do this, but I bet you if you bought two broken cameras of the same model, you could probably make a working one with the parts that are in there. Because it's not that common to have, you know, two of the same fault in a camera, unless there's some systemic fault in the camera itself. But, you know, for actual tips, I would recommend that you buy one camera, figure out what's wrong with it, and find another camera that doesn't appear to have the same problem. That way, you can generally know that you have two cameras with different parts that are probably able to combine to make one functioning unit. I admit, for the Olympus E1 that I got, I went the route of rolling the dice. I bought two, uh, and I didn't really figure out what was wrong with them until I got them, and 
just kind of got lucky. Now, another thing with the cameras, especially with the older ones, uh, but not all of them, is that generally you'll have some assembly or disassembly instructions somewhere online. Uh, you'll generally be able to follow the disassembly and you'll probably be fine doing that, especially if you kind of know what you're already looking for to replace. Uh, you know, there are sites that show you how to convert cameras to infrared cameras, and doing that usually requires breaking down the camera pretty substantially. So that those guys will generally get you pretty pretty far along the way if it, when it comes to trying to disassemble a camera. However, if you can't find information on how to disassemble a camera, you can also do some other stuff to help mitigate any potential problems. Uh, and that would be basically getting out your smartphone or a camera and just recording your progress along, along the way. That way, if you do end up needing to retrace things when something goes sideways, you can just play back the video and see where the part was or where things disconnected and where things gotta go. It's basically why this particular video exists. I couldn't really find a lot of great resources on the E1, so I figure if I'm gonna disassemble this thing, I'm gonna need to create some information for myself. And I recorded the video of me disassembling it and reassembling it just in case if I needed to stop and look back at some video to see if I you know, was doing things right. Uh, but in the end for this particular video and for this particular camera, I didn't end up needing to actually go back to review any footage. I was able to reassemble the camera fairly easily, but it's still something good to get used to doing if you are gonna venture into the world of repair. Now, before we get into it, uh, I do, again, I wanna encourage people, if you do wanna try and you can kind of stomach a bit of risk, uh, since this doesn't always work out well, try a camera repair. It's not super hard. And I think generally, if you're even a little bit handy, it'll save you money in the long run. Now, in this specific case, uh, you know, E1s nowadays are kind of collectible cameras, so they kind of sell for a little more than, you know, what I'm normally willing to pay for a camera of this age. They're going for somewhere between like 175 to 250 USD on average. I've seen some sell for higher, I've seen some sell for a little lower, but you know, that's more than an Olympus E300. It's more than a Nikon D200, and that camera is basically perfect. Uh, together, my two broken E1s, as I got them, was about 90 USD, so quite a bit less than the uh, you know average cost of a functioning one. But with all that said, let's get into it. So, what was wrong with the Olympus E1s that I bought? Well. One of them had a very straightforward issue. The uh, compact flash card slot, which I'm holding right here, that was mangled. Pins were destroyed. A couple pins actually were bent so far back that they actually broke off the actual PCB. So not a good card slot, unable to card. Uh, the other thing that was wrong with the E1 was that the generally it was in a bit of a rough shape. Top plate had quite a bit of damage, there was damage on the front plate as well, and none of the grippy material was grippy anymore. Basically came off and just left a sticky adhesive like remaining. So it wasn't a very pretty camera. That being said, that E1 did power up, and when you click the shutter button, it did fire. So otherwise, it seemed that most of the camera actually functioned, despite its kind of ugly appearance. Uh, the other E1 that I ended up getting, that had a seemingly good CF card slot. However, the shutter wouldn't fire and the meter actually seemed to just freeze. Once in a while it would give you a reading, uh, but the numbers would be just out to lunch. So there were some problems there. Later on when I disassembled the camera, I actually found some surface mount parts that appeared to be not good. One of those parts is actually near the sensor, this here, I don't know if, you can, if it'll focus. So uh, yeah, it, yeah, it's hard to see, but that, where my finger is, there's a inductor and it looks like it had had a bad day. So at the least there was some contributing damage to, you know, the failure of the camera. So on top of that, when I looked at the other part of the board, 
here some of the components on top looked like they were worse for wear than on the other camera. So I figure something on there combined with something on here gave up and uh, the camera did not want to camera. So I did what you normally do. I scavenged the CF card reader off the one camera with a dead main board and potentially not quite perfect sensor board. And I moved that onto the camera, which, which had a functioning shutter, had a seemingly functioning sensor, and otherwise, aside from the visual ugliness, worked pretty well. I then decided to give it a bit of a visual upgrade, as you can see here. And I took the top plate from the nicer camera, the back plate from the nice camera, and I kept just the front from the original one because I didn't want to remove the sensor from the uh, mounting bits. Additionally, I did scavenge the uh, rubber grippy bits and I put them on the quite mangled, uh, over top of the uh, mangled adhesive. And it actually appears to be sticking. That's basically it. Uh, with all that, I now have functioning, functioning Olympus E1. Uh, so, all that being said, the experience was overall super nice. It was a pretty good camera to disassemble, and now that I have experience kind of taking this particular thing apart, if I find another E1 uh, and it maybe has parts that I currently have, I might take another stab at just refurbishing this, the things. But let's get into the time lapse video of you know, my actual repair. Uh, so upcoming is the uh, video of me doing the repair. It's filmed on a Osmo Pocket 1 with a wide angle adapter on the front, and it's rendered at 10 times the normal speed, just, an, just, just so that you're not sitting through a one hour video of me kind of faffing about. All right, let's have a look.
All right, so this was, I know, a little bit of a different video, uh, different from when I did my EM5 repair, a little more talky-talky between me and you. But I'll be honest, it does seem like this is legitimately how I get my camera sometimes. Now, some of you, again, have seen my EM5 Mark I repair, and that was a very similar story. I ended up buying two EM5s and kind of jamming the other parts to make one working EM5. But I also, I also ended up acquiring uh, at some point an Al Sony Alpha 99. And I got it for a steal of a deal given that those cameras look like they sell for around like 700 USD st still. Uh, when I got mine, it actually had a broken lens eject button and the SLT mirror had a nick in it. So what did I do? I got the camera home, I had a quick look over, and I modeled and printed a lens eject button, and I then ordered a new SLT mirror. Uh, that ended up being a fairly simple repair, but it ended up only costing me about 275 USD all said and done with new parts uh, manufactured and installed on the A99. So again, much cheaper than buying a uh, functioning A99. Now, I also want to mention that like, if you're someone that is a kind of hands-on, these can be a lot of fun and really re rewarding to do. So, you know, you'll get to build some experience fixing things. You'll hopefully get a new toy at the end of uh, your experience. Uh, and the best part, you get to save some money while doing it. But you can probably guess that uh, it's not for everyone. I understand that, you know, this, this stuff isn't for a lot of people, but for those of you that are interested, you know, if you have some questions or whatnot, feel free to hit me up in the comments below. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know, expect the Olympus E1 video to come out at some point soon. But otherwise, don't forget, like and subscribe and leave a comment down below. Otherwise, till next time. Bye.